Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around. I know it's a long day. OK, so our programmers headed to another bursting bubble. That's the title of the blog post that this talk is based on. And the answer is no. So now you can all leave, and we're done. You know, <laughs> Thanks for coming. It was great. OK, more seriously, I think the answer I hope to leave you with is well, actually, it's quite complicated. For some people, the answer is going to be yes. For other of you, the answer is going to be no. But a little bit about me. My name is Tyler Elliott Battilion. You can call me Teb for short. I used to work at some startups doing programming. None of those startups matter. You can decide if you think I matter after you hear my thoughts today. Mostly, I spend my time writing about technology and its impact on society. I also release uh, educational materials online for free. So if you want to check some of those out, you can talk to me after the talk. So what is this talk about? This talk is about the fact that historically, throughout time, we as humans have always endeavored to make our labors obsolete. This is a picture of pin setters. I don't think any of you have seen any small boys being paid terrible wages to set up pins after you've been bowling. And this is a cotton gin, obviously a revolutionary piece of agricultural equipment, which you know has been replaced by even bigger and more revolutionary agricultural pieces of equipment. And more specifically, this talk is about how this happens in software. So on the top left over here, I hope some of you recognize these. I saw, I saw a picture of a punch card in one other talk today. But some of you, I hope, don't recognize these. This stack of cards used to be how programmers wrote programs. They would take these programs, punch holes in them, representing the binary for the machine code instructions. You can see one of these machines at the um, the Computer Science History Museum in Palo Alto. I highly recommend it. If you're staying through Sunday, you can go see a very nice little pieces of computer science history, even though it's in Palo Alto. OK? <laughs> just a few little cute tidbits about this kind of programming. The, all of that red marking is not just junk that's accumulated over time. That red stripe tells you the order that these punch cards go in. So if one of them contains a bug, you can swap it out re-punch in the machine code that you meant in binary, and slide it back in in the right place. All these little markings that are hard to read, those are the names of subroutines. Those are the functions. So you know, no command O, go to function, no control click, right? Go find those cards, replace the function if you want to. I can tell you I would not be a programmer if this is what programming meant. So for those of you who did this, power to you, to the rest of us, you know, Thank God for Grace Hopper, basically. OK, after that, we had assembly language. It's a snippet of x86. And then down here is a snippet from OTP. Someone in this room might have written that piece of code, I hope. Who knows? OK, it's also about the way that hardware has changed. And the changes in hardware are controlling the way that software gets written. Obviously, punch cards are very different from digital machine code that we write by hand or digital assembly code that we write by hand. But the invention of the silicon transistor you know, is a huge, important piece of computer programming history, and there's going to be more hardware advancements. I don't know if you've heard, but Moore's law is dead. We are not getting smaller transistors anymore. We're not going to make it past the 5 nanometer mark. Maybe graphene will save us, but more likely, we're stuck with vectorized instructions, SIMD, CP, uh, GPUs, TPUs. This talks about that, too. OK, what else does this talk about? It's about Trends in software as a service, trends in education, trends in programming languages that are changing what it means to be a software engineer and changing what jobs are available for software engineers. So a little bit of forecasting there. Squarespace is making some of us web developers a little bit obsolete. There's a chance that some of us might not have exactly the same kinds of jobs that we have now. We'll talk about that more later. Okay. And finally, I will close my talk with a little bit of advice for you about what I think you should do to stay relevant. It's just one man's opinion, so you know, please seek other sources on this. Basically, it boils down to never stop learning, and I'll tell you what I think the right stuff to focus on will be. You, know, you can't learn every new thing, but you can learn some stuff that helps you learn other stuff much quicker. I'm going to give you advice in that direction. So now that I've told you what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start telling you. Don't worry, I won't tell you what I told you after the talk unless you come talk to me in the foyer. Okay? So my first point is that automation is inevitable. There are a ton of reasons why this is true, but the incentives have always been aligned for humans to want to eliminate certain human labor with technology. Maybe it's because we hate doing something and would rather it be automatic. Maybe it's because I'm a capitalist and I want to capture more of my value from the work that gets done. So I don't want to pay you. I would rather pay for the electricity for a machine. Right? Simple, straightforward. 
Here is some examples of industries that have been automated or are in the threat of being automated. You can look at big agriculture. That's a huge one, right? We do not have a lot of people walking through fields anymore. We have giant machines that harvest our food for us. Okay, we have automated factories, automatic assembly. We are looking at self-driving cars, but this is a long, long tradition. I don't think there's any good reason to believe that that tradition should stop. Well, maybe it should, but it won't. Okay? At the same time, we've seen huge population increase, but even though automation has continued for a long, long time, and the population has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, we still don't seem to be out of work to do. So I think that's interesting. If you're the type of person who reads news articles that say, AI is going to automate all of us out of existence, there will be no jobs for us anymore, I will say, well, maybe. I don't know if the evidence supports that claim. In 1960, we had 3 billion people on the planet who all needed jobs or whatever, right? Now we have 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. And there's not a clear like correlation with unemployment rates. They go up and down. Right now, here in the city that we are in, unemployment is about 3%, even though more people than ever live here and more things have been automated than ever. So it's not so straightforward, but, you know, Population's gone up. We have seen change in the share of jobs, where people are working. So here's a chart that shows how the share of employers in the agricultural industry have changed over time. Since 1991, you can see in basically every region of the world, the share of people employed doing agricultural work has fallen. Look down at the bottom. That's North America. We are under 5% of our workers in the United States employed in agriculture. I think that's very interesting. I think there are obviously some automation issues there. I think there are probably also some like unreported worker problems in these statistics. <laughs> but nevertheless, the trend is global and we are decreasing the amount of people who need to work to produce food even though we are feeding way more people than ever before. Automation is kind of wonderful in that regard. Okay, you can look at work in industry. This is like factory workers. Things have remained relatively flat. There's one really interesting trend in here. If you can see the North America line and the South Asia line, South Asia starts at 15%. It's the lowest red on the, starting on the left. They do a little switch starting in 2006 where they go shoop. In North America, we see a nice little decline in industry in factory type work. And in South Asia, we see a nice little uptick. What's that? Outsourcing, right? Okay, so we are sending jobs to cheap laborers in South America, or sorry, South Asia. They're doing that work for us. That's another trend that programmers will have to be worried about outsourcing, okay? And then the service industry looks like everybody is going uphill in service industry. We're automating all these things. We're doing all these processes that are manual labor automatically. What do humans do with their time now? Serve other humans, okay? So that's another interesting thing that I think you should look out for. The human to human aspect of life is more important when we don't have to do manual labor. So when you know, the singularity comes and enslaves us all and whatever, who knows when that's going to happen, but this won't be true then. But until that happens, it might be important to think about how your work relates to other humans and how you are serving other human people, not so much just automating things out of existence. Okay. There are some troubling things about automation. I would say that this chart is transparently partially about automation. There's other things going on here, but the capital class, the top 1% of people we now know in 2019 are earning much more relative to the bottom 99%. The people who control the machines, who own the machines, who make the machines are capturing more value out of the labor of the machines than they were out of paying someone to do that labor. And you know, that's perfectly straightforward. I own a machine that has value. I can pay it negligible amounts of electrical costs versus paying a human $15 to $100 an hour to do something. If I'm a capitalist and I want to capture the most value out of my services, I want a robot to do it, right? And there are some, you know, I'm not going to turn this into an economic stock, but there are some reasons that maybe we should be concerned about that trend. And at the same time, Global poverty levels have gone down. And this is also, I think, transparently partially about automation. The extent to which we've automated the food harvesting process allows us to feed all 7.7K, not all, but a larger percentage than in the past of a smaller number of overall people. And this is also because we're able to do more things more efficiently. So 
automation is a double-edged sword. It might be leading to a capital class that owns everything and we'll just have a destitute class a la your favorite dystopian novel. And at the same time, we might still, there's a chance that we will still end up in the world of Star Trek where everything is covered and it works and we've got replicators and everyone's happy. We in the technology world are, you know, a big part of where we go. So I hope that you take that responsibility seriously and, you know, really think about how you as a person are impacting these trends and what it means. Okay. But anyway, I'll get off my high horse. Boom. Next point. Software automates itself. This is a picture of an Ouroboros. That's a snake that eats its own tail. That's a metaphor. Okay. First, I'm going to tell you all of the ways in which software destroys jobs that used to exist. After that, I'm going to tell you all of the ways that having destroyed all of the software that used to exist actually just creates more demand for software. And at the end, you'll be stuck wondering whether the snake's going to get bigger or smaller or stay the same size. Beautiful. Okay, so software automates itself. I showed the punch cards at the beginning of this talk. I know that many of you did not ever program on punch cards. I wanted to replace this picture with Grace Hopper because it would be very pertinent, the inventor of the first compiler, but I thought you wouldn't get the reference. So anyway, we first had punch cards. Then we had digital assembly code that we were still typing binary by hand. Then we had assemblers, and we were like, oh my gosh, I can write x86. I'm so happy about that, which is kind of insane. Then we had compilers, and we're happy about writing C and K. All the way along this process, there were people who were like, OK, when the first compiler comes out, they say, Oh, you're never going to be efficient using a compiled language. That compilation process is going to take you like 80 seconds every time you run it. It's going to be so slow for you. OK, well, surprise, 2019. And now we've got just-in-time compilers and virtual machines and interpreters, all these things that people said would be slow, but Moore's Law made them fast. We're happy about that. OK? So we get rid of a lot of time that would have been spent development. I hope that it's obvious if all of you had to write the code that you write today in Erlang or Elixir or Python or Go or whatever language you use, if you had to write that same code in x86 assembly, I hope it's quite obvious that it would take you longer to do that. <laughs> Even in C, longer to do that, right? So we make things faster. We make, you know, we, we need fewer programmers because we need fewer people thinking because we need fewer time. That's an assertion that I'm going to assert later is not true, but hold it for now. Okay, and it's not limited to languages and compilers that kind of take code, turn it into other code that actually runs on your machine. Things like TensorFlow allow us to write code that describes code that we want to run. You know, when you create a neural network using TensorFlow, you're describing the neural network that you want to exist in Python. But the code that actually gets emitted and run on your GPU has nothing to do with Python. I'm here to tell you that CPython is not running on your GPU. It receives a series of matrix operations that are highly parallelized and can run really fast. So we even have higher level versions in these frameworks of what you know, I was just talking about with compilers and interpreters. Electron's another fascinating example of this. And whether or not you think it's a good idea to ship a separate instance of Chrome with every one of your apps, it is transparently clear that the existence of Electron causes a whole host of people who wouldn't have been able to, you know, currently with their right now skill set, write native applications for Windows or for Mac OS. And now they can write those native applications. So I'm not sure that every time I boot up Slack, I should be booting up a separate instance of Chrome. And all those developers who are working at Slack and not writing C++ might feel pretty happy about the fact that I'm booting up a separate instance of Chrome, right? So good or bad, it's certainly changing the way there's demand for certain types of programmers, and it's certainly changing the way work gets done. There's, you know, you can ham and haw all day about whether this is efficient and fast, but it is happening and it is changing the way the development landscape looks for you laborers of developers, okay? And it's not just limited to even language things. AWS and Azure and a myriad other cloud hosting technologies are ways to replace a person who used to exist at almost every small to medium sized company. The guy who could buy your servers, install them, run the cable, get it outside, hook it up and talk to your ISP, enable your DNS, and make sure that you were thinking about exactly how much load that server needed, buying the right hardware, replacing the hardware when it was going to go down. Now, at a smaller, medium-sized company, all you need to know is a little bit of Linux. Use your terminal. 
You don't need that person anymore. You don't need to hire someone to build you a server room, keep it the right temperature, think about how many cores you need, that type of stuff. Certainly, some companies need that, right? If you're working for Netflix, you have companions at Netflix who do a ton of interesting hardware stuff. If you work at AWS as a network engineer, there are some hardware people there, right? But for a lot of us today, if I asked you like, hey, you wanna start a new web company with me? Are we gonna hire a server engineer to build our own server room? I hope many of you would say, uh, well, not yet. Uh, maybe later, right? Okay. And then there's services like Squarespace and Salesforce that are replacing the need for engineers entirely, right? AWS replaced the need for one type of engineer who knows stuff about hardware and can build a server room with another type of engineer, someone who knows Linux and can configure a terminal and can think about distributed systems, but only through the realm of software. Squarespace is a service that says, hey, web developers, we don't need you. Okay, and obviously that's not true of people who are like working on highly dynamic, highly scaled web services, but there used to be a huge cottage industry for people who could write static websites, get it hosted somewhere, and then deliver it to your customer. Some restaurant pops up, they need a website that just says, hi, this is where you can find me, this is the number you can call, you can make a reservation for these times, here's the menu, boom. Make that website, ship it, we're good to go. Okay, Squarespace makes those types of developers a lot less valuable now in the current market. Because why would I pay an engineer when I could pay a high school student who's a power user of computers to build me a nice looking website? Makes stuff like that easy. Salesforce, I argue, is the same kind of idea as Squarespace, but on the database side of things. You don't necessarily, if you're starting a small business these days, need to hire a database administrator and a database analyst to connect things to your point of sales system, et cetera, et cetera. You just spin up a Salesforce instance and call it good. Intel, it's not good enough, and then you hire some engineers, but that happens later in the process. Okay, so that's the last I'm gonna say about software automating itself out of existence. I hope it's clear that software works hard to make certain old kinds of software irrelevant. But software also creates demand for itself, and it creates demand for other things too. Okay, so one example, just building on the last slide, is that software literacy, not necessarily software expertise, in a world where software tools like Squarespace exist, a little bit of software literacy becomes a very valuable skill for many people to have. If you know HTML and CSS, you're a better user of Squarespace. There are interfaces for you to tweak the CSS directly. It's still just a wrapper around those technologies that exist, so understanding them without really having to know a ton still makes you a better power user of that tool. Same thing, basic SQL helps you be a better power user of tools like Salesforce or like Tableau, okay? More interestingly, the proliferation of software, not necessarily the changes in, you know, compilers and languages, I think that's part of why software is proliferated, but the proliferation of software through the internet, the adoption of software and hardware technologies, creates a growing body of people who use software. And when you have a lot of human users, you also need more people who can help those users actually interact with your software. So my argument here is that there's a huge and growing need for good design among the software development community. Not only in terms of like web pages and web interfaces, but in terms of say Alexa and other smart digital assistants. Those have a user interface that's being designed by people. It's not like a visual thing that you're designing on a page, but they have trees and commands and commands that lead to commands and these systems all have to be designed by people who understand the way people are going to use these technologies. So people who feel strongly about designing products that humans want to use, thinking about human psychology, these people are becoming a little more valuable within the realm of software engineering as you know companions and teammates of the software engineers who are thinking more about how the data should be managed and what makes the system efficient, okay? My next point is that 
Software innovation drives further innovation. First example here is big data. We created the internet, we have all these systems that are collecting data all the time, and eventually someone was like, wow, I have a lot of data, I would like to learn something from this data to make that data valuable. So we started thinking about software ways to process that big data. Once we started processing that big data and thinking about like, okay, we need to optimize for I.O. now, we need to be careful about making sure we're reading big blocks from the hard drive, we made advancements in specialized hardware that were really good at doing those specific things. So now we have big data and big data processing. We've got to drive innovation in GPUs and TPUs, and so on and so on and so on, right? So when we create new big ideas like how to handle big data, we also create new interesting kinds of demands and new forms of innovation that we wouldn't have thought about before we needed to process big data. Software security is another example of this. The proliferation of the Internet of Things, phones in our pockets, computers everywhere has created a huge, enormous number of attack vectors, and there's no way to put this cat back in the bag. The only thing we can do now is write more software to try and secure these software systems that are making us all vulnerable all the time. So, you know, hooray, we've all got jobs in the software security industry if you want them. Great time to get into software security in, you know, any sort of hat color. <laughs> Not that I can, you know, I can either confirm nor deny any of the allegations posed against me at this time unless I'm in the presence of my lawyer. Am I under arrest or free to go? Anyway. So, okay. Lots of things in software are also kind of like arms races, right? So, First we had email, then we've got fraudulent email. Now we've got fraud detection, now we've got better fraudsters. Now we've got better fraud detection, now we've got better fraudsters. Now we've got better fraud detection. And you just keep on competing with your adversaries endlessly forever. So if you can find one of these sorts of worlds to be in, that's a good form of job security. People are always gonna wanna rip someone off. If you wanna stop people from getting ripped off, you can get better at stopping people from getting ripped off than the people who are ripping those people off, boom. Twitter, same example. Twitter led to Twitter bots, now we have bot detection, now we've got Russia building better undetectable bots, now we're gonna have to have better bot detection, et cetera. Deep fakes, you've seen some of these amazing images made by generative adversarial networks, or maybe you saw Jordan Peele impersonate Barack Obama, incredible stuff. Now, we need to be able to detect those deep fakes, and then they'll make better deep fakes that are undetectable, and so on, so on, so on, okay? And finally, the proliferation of software has also created a huge unmet need for people who are technology savvy but are willing to work adjacent to technology. I don't know if any of you watched our Congress or our Senate interview Mark Zuckerberg, for example, but they don't know, right? It's embarrassing and it's kind of disgusting to me how badly our politicians misunderstand things that are so important and fundamental to what's happening today in our political ecosystem, right? I don't think anyone in this room would deny that Twitter and Facebook both had an impact on the way elections around the world have been going. There are certainly a huge way that we receive and collect information, and we don't have politicians that understand those systems. Similarly, in law, our intellectual property laws are totally whack for software. I don't know if any of you have ever like filed a patent or gotten a copyright on your software and actually gone through that process, but it's not good. It doesn't make any sense. We need intellectually property, uh, you know, people who are savvy in intellectual property and savvy in the technology that they're writing intellectual property laws about, okay? Same thing for educators, same thing for writers and reporters, on and on and on on the list. So if you're a little burned out on writing software, there's lots of opportunities for you to not throw away what you've already learned, but rather be super beneficial and super you know, rare in the fact that you really understand the technology and you're willing to go understand politics or you're willing to go understand law, okay? So, also related to whether or not programmers are headed for another bursting bubble is the fact that the education space is changing quickly right now. So, this is a chart that shows the growth up to 2015, a little bit old, but growth of computer science majors entering, you know, this is not graduates, this is people entering a computer science department. It's been going up and it surpassed the dot-com peak. Here's a longer view of that same chart. I like looking at this because you can see the personal computing revelation in the 80s first and then it's like, oh, well, maybe, 
we weren't as excited as we thought we. And then you can see the dot com boom and crash after that in the 2000s. So we certainly have historical evidence to say things might go up and down, right? But the trend of this line is also up. And for all of the reasons that I previously discussed, I think there's also good reasons to think we're going to be on an upward trend for a little bit longer. We'll find out when the crash happens. You know, and we've seen it in specific industries now. I think it's safe to say cryptocurrency crashed, right? I think it's maybe safe to say. Yeah, we'll talk after. Uh, <laughs> It's maybe safe to say that AI is in a little bit of a deflating bubble period. I think that remains to be seen, but certainly on the research side of things, people are saying that. So we should expect ups and downs, especially in specific sub-industries, but due to the overall proliferation, my argument is as long as you're flexible and can like move around a little bit within the field, you know, if you were a cryptocurrency person, now you're going to be like, well, I know distributed systems, I know about consensus, I know about hash algorithms, I know about public key encryption. Well, I'll just go get a job doing stuff with all those fundamentals that I know even though cryptocurrency is dead, right? Okay, cool. CS is not the only way to get into programming as I'm sure many of you know. There's also a huge trend towards creating college replacements, boot camps, which are not exactly college replacements. They're more like trade schools or reskilling schools, but these types of programs, alternatives to your traditional computer science degree, are hugely growing. So we're competing with more and more different kinds of people for jobs now, right? And I argue this is just good. If we can get people with different backgrounds interested in programming, they're going to start solving problems that the CS people never thought were problems in the first place. This goes back to my argument about good design in certain cases. You know, I don't know if you've ever worked with that engineer who's made the user interface, and you're like, why is this a raw form with 700 fields for me to fill out in text? I know, right? So we're getting lots of different kinds of people from different backgrounds. It also means there's been a little bit of saturation in some of the, you know, I'll say easier to learn subgenres of programming. If you can learn it in three months, lots of people have been doing that, learning it in three months, and now you're competing with a lot of people who only had to learn three months worth of stuff that makes it harder for you to find a job. It depresses your wages if that's where you find yourself. So for people who are thinking, oh man, I hope that's not me, just keep on learning. It'll be fine. Just keep on learning. It takes a lifetime to become an expert in anything. Okay, last point about education. I thought it was very interesting. This is from the Stack Overflow 2018 developer survey. Half of people, almost 45% of people who went to boot camps were reskilling, not learning to program for the first time. So people who've been working at Oracle on Java stuff for 10 years, you know, their life is office space and they want to bring it into Silicon Valley, right? So they go to a boot camp, learn some JavaScript, learn some Node, learn some Ruby. This is a good path for you. There's lots and lots of new ways to learn lots and lots of new things. Don't be afraid of reskilling. Just because you were an expert at something doesn't mean there's not something new to become an expert at. And lots of people who are going to boot camps are doing it for that reason. Okay, this is just like my second to last point about whether or not programs are headed to a towards a bursting bubble. Then I'll give you some quick advice about how to not find yourself on the wrong side of that bubble if it bursts. There's always going to be a frontier. So while there's more and more jobs like I argued about for people who are just software literate, not software expert, people who can write code but don't necessarily know what's going on at the operating system level, there's also always going to be some very well remunerated jobs for people who are changing what's possible right now. And there's a few subfields I would say you should look at if you're interested in being one of those people. Biotech is exploding. We've had the first genetically engineered humans born in China. Go look it up. It's crazy. That's right. They knocked out a gene called CCR5. I can tell you all about it. Very, very fascinating stuff. Robotics. People are really interested in robotics control. That's related to process automation and doing things quicker or space travel security. And then I left distributed computing on there. I don't think distributed computing is really the frontier anymore. I think that's something that was the frontier five years ago and is now actually pretty mainstream. We saw a lot of talks here about companies that are big, major companies doing distributed computing every day. Doesn't mean that there's not great jobs in that field. It means it's a normal field. It's not, you know, if you're doing distributed computing, most of you aren't changing what's possible. You've read the papers, you're doing a standard consensus algorithm, something like that. Some of you are, but distributed computing, it's here. 
Cool. Okay. Last overarching point about what's going to change about the way the programming labor landscape works. Here in Silicon Valley, we used to have a much stronger monopoly than we have right now. I know many of you are from lots and lots of different places, and I think that's evidence of this argument. Back in the 90s, though, when the dot-com bubble hit, it's like we had a much higher concentration of all of the people working on programming than we do now. So there's tech hubs popping up everywhere. Here, it's like Denver, Salt Lake City, New York, Austin, new places where there's lots and lots of technology work happening, and around the world, Bangalore, Berlin, Shenzhen, right? So we are competing as technologists with more people from around the world, but at the same time, it also opens up a larger job market for us as individuals. So this is kind of like a double-edged sword. We're definitely having to compete with offshoring and nearshoring. If you're doing something that someone else could do in a different place and they're willing to do it for cheaper, guess what? Your company doesn't care that much about you. I know you all love your companies, but, but they like you. They don't love you. You're not, <laughs> you're not family. So it makes it easier for you to be like, well, great, I'm going to move to Kansas and buy a giant mansion for the money that I've been saving up that's not even a down payment here in this area. And boom, I'll keep my remote job and keep getting paid San Francisco wages. And it's like cheating. I've met a ton of people who are doing that, by the way. So smart. <laughs> and at the same time, for the very, very, very best jobs, you know, the top research gigs at Google, the ones that you really want to have, you're now competing with all the best people in the whole world, not just with the best people who are able to relocate and live in San Francisco or live in Palo Alto, God forbid. <laughs> so. Given all of that, how do I think you should think about managing your time, managing your education, staying relevant in a changing software world? My first point is pretty straightforward. Don't get complacent. Keep learning. You know, Learn something new every day. Set aside time. Make it a priority. It doesn't always matter what you learn, but always be learning stuff. It does matter sometimes what you pick. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But if all you do, if this is the only thing you take away from my talk, learn something every day. I'll feel good. I've done my job. Okay. Next point is learn how to work with people. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but no matter what position within the realm of software engineering you find yourself in, your coworkers are going to be people and your consumers are going to be people, almost certainly. So learn how to communicate with people. Learn how to understand people. If you are the person that everyone wants to work with, that is more valuable, in my opinion, than being the person who is best in the world at that thing. People disagree with that. There are brilliant jerks who've made tons of money. You know, Steve Jobs is like pretty famous for good reason, you know. But in my opinion, if you want to remain relevant, always have job stability. Be a person that other people want to work with. Because then, when your friends leave and get a new job, you'll be like, hey, you remember how nice it was working with me? And they'll be like, yeah, I do. You want a new job? OK, boom. Next, whatever your field is, learn the fundamentals of that field. If you speak one human language and you understand grammar, it will make it a lot easier for you to learn your next human language. If you play one instrument and you learn music theory, it will make it easier for you to learn your next instrument. If you speak one programming language and you learn the fundamentals of data structures and algorithms, it will make it easier for you to learn your next programming language. If you are in design, learn a little human psychology. Just Focus on having a baseline understanding of the knowledge that's going to connect all the little specialties that you could possibly go to. And that'll make it easier for you to move laterally between the subfields. Okay? But some of the stuff you learn is not going to be foundational stuff. Deal with it. You know, we're all going to learn another IDE in our life, and we're going to learn some new key bindings. Bummer. You have to switch languages, you're going to learn some new syntax, you're going to switch industries, you're going to learn the domain specifics of those industries. Don't worry about that too much. You're going to learn some irrelevant stuff, or at least it'll become irrelevant. And at the same time, try not to learn too many of those irrelevant things. So if you are a web developer, you're doing front end stuff, and you already speak Angular and React, don't learn Vue and Arulia and Knockout and Ember and all these other frameworks until you have to, right? Learn to. Trust yourself that you'll be able to learn the next one. And then when you change jobs and they're like, hey, we're using Vue. Do you speak Vue? You'll be like, yeah, I speak Vue in two days from now. Just 
Get on with it. Okay. And the same thing goes for languages and for tools and for anything, you know, really. If you understand the foundations and you understand two of the same specialty, the third one's basically free. So don't spend too much time just learning every new IDE or every new web framework or every new language extension, whatever. Focus on what's shared between the ones you already know, and that'll help you learn whatever's coming next for you. Okay, so that's my talk. Thank you so much for coming. Do we have any questions? <laughs> we got one here. Yep. Uh, could you speak a bit more about the AI bubble debatably worsting? Sure. So people who say we might be headed towards an AI winter are mostly concerned about like the the big changes that we've seen, the big breakthroughs that we've seen in the use of neural nets has mostly been related to just sending hugely more data on the research side of things. There haven't been a lot of huge breakthroughs either in like the fundamentals of the software. You know, neural nets are like the hot thing right now. Those were invented in the 70s. The change that allowed us to use neural nets efficiently was a big hardware change. GPUs, TPUs, making the optimization algorithms more efficient, but the optimization algorithms haven't changed that much. So in my view, there's still a huge amount of applicability to the research that's already been done. So there will be some really interesting industrial work that solves people's problems using AI. But I'm not necessarily so certain that we're on the verge of a really big breakthrough in the algorithmic side of AI. We're using algorithms that are pretty well known, honestly. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. making sure the beer's out there. <laughs> I hope so. Um, so I, several years ago, I heard a talk that was um, talking about the rise of um, you know, information technology. And that was correlated to also like the, the rise of the incarceration rate and the correction system here in the US. Um, I, I was wondering if you had any, uh, you know, any thoughts on <clears throat> things that we need to watch out for. I know when this, uh, when this talk was mentioned, uh, it was given to given by a guy that was in robotics, and he was saying that like he you know he stays up at night worrying that he might influence that with the work that he's doing, and now like you see some of like the, you know the political climate and the villainization of immigrants sure. and the indefinite like detention of folks like that. So you know I just like to see what you think about that. Yeah, great question. So I would say for for those of us especially who are working in any place where we're collecting sensitive data from people, we really need to do a much better job about taking that responsibility seriously. I think that the programming industry as a whole has been pretty flip, and I think that like everything we see in the news about Facebook and Twitter, they're like kind of apologizing, but they're not really taking responsibility for anything. I think that's hugely problematic, and I think that's related to what you're asking about is that we have responsibilities to our users that extend beyond just like give them our service, right? If we're collecting a social security number, if we're collecting information about someone's sexual orientation, if we're collecting information that could put that person in a dangerous situation, you know, we need to be really clear about what our responsibility is to those users. That was a great talk, Tyler. Thanks. Do you have any thoughts on if or when the governments might start regulating the software development industry? Oh, love it. I think there's an appetite for it, okay? GDPR was a big deal and it's resulting in some pretty significant fines. Europe is ahead of us on this question. But have you heard of the California Consumer Protection Act? of 2018 goes into effect in 2020. Okay, so California just passed a pretty broad, um, I, 
Depends on who you ask. It's a little bit weaker, I would say, than the GDPR, but still focused on privacy. That's one area of big interest. The other area to me where regulators are starting to kind of like tick their ears up is in antitrust. So you can read Tim Wu's new book, The Curse of Bigness, but there is a growing interest in saying like, hey, I know that we used to think the only way monopolies were bad is when they made prices go up, and Amazon's making prices go down, but they still kind of look like a monopoly, right? So there's a little more interest in, especially in those two areas right now. And part of that's because of visibility. You know, we've seen huge scandals like Cambridge Analytica that brought privacy into the, the public sphere. And that's another way that we all can be like ambassadors to social good is talking about with our inside knowledge just how whack the state of things like privacy are and help our less technical friends understand that it's not this abstract, amorphous, ambiguous threat, that it's like a you know, real, pretty tangible threat to certain people. Good question, thank you. Um, I have like a complimentary question about that. Um, I'm wondering, um, do you think that someday actually companies might exert more pressure on governments than the opposite? I think that happened already like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, 100%, especially smaller governments. So, you know, if you're talking about like companies exerting more power than the United States government, maybe not super soon, but also at the same time, how many state governments were bending over backwards to give up their tax base to the largest, most profitable company in the world that paid zero dollars in federal taxes? If that's not Amazon putting more pressure on local governments than those local governments are putting back on them, I don't know what is. No, but I, I meant like clear authority over some, some law regulation. Oh, like control? Yeah. Um, I don't know the degree to which they'll be able to fully control, but I, I do have a lot of concerns about like regulatory capture. You know, Ajit Pai chairs the FCC. So he's a former Verizon lawyer. He doesn't have the people's interest at heart. He's made it quite clear, in my opinion, but we can talk about that too. But so I think absolutely you're right to be worried about it. I think it is happening now to a degree. I don't know if I can give a strong answer about when I think or if I think it'll happen completely to, to any big mainstream governments like the United States. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Of course, yes. You, you briefly mentioned uh, the difference in the classes, richer classes uh, making more money than the poor ones. Uh, can you speak to currently, especially in the Bay Area, this kind of thing where uh, the tech people are becoming a class of their own compared to everyone else in the industry yeah. or in, in the population in general? Yeah, I think you're spot on there. And I don't know, it's something that makes me really sad. I live out in Berkeley, so I see this all the time. And the the contrast between like the tech workers, if you just have a minute and you want to not have like a, a necessarily super fun experience, but one that's really educational, go out to Market Street and walk from you know Market Street at the Embarcadero all the way to Twitter's headquarters, Market Street on the 8th. And you'll see you know the Twitter office and right outside the Twitter office, you'll see people sleeping in tents, right? And I mean, there's definitely a big part of it is just the way our incentives are aligned. A, another big part of it, at least in my opinion, is to do with the way people come and go from the Bay Area. It's a place where not a lot of locals from the Bay Area live here anymore. They've been forced out because housing prices keep going up and up and up, and rich people like me move in and take their places that they were living, you know. And it becomes really hard for lots of different types of people to live in a place. And then the stratification just keeps on growing. So I think you're exactly right that especially the big tech companies, the big tech company lobbies, and the way that like our taxes are allocated, for instance, are one part of the problem. But I think there's also kind of an interpersonal degree of the problem where a lot of the people who live here in the Bay Area have only been living here for five to 10 years. And they don't necessarily feel like they have roots here. Their family is not from here. They don't feel necessarily like part of the community. It's a very transient experience. And then they leave after they come here, make it big, sell their company. Then they move out to Sausalito, and, or they move further and buy a house back where they're from. So there's a lot to, that goes into it. I think you're right. 
I don't know that I have any really great you know, silver bullet solutions to it, except to try and be aware, and try and be aware of our own role that we play and, and advocate for better policy and a little more humanity. Okay, let's hear it for Tyler. <laughs> 